So uh, today is not the second, by the way. There, there was an interesting, like if, if we all live another 200 years, we'll see, uh, we'll be February 2nd, uh, 2222, which that's <laughs> going to be quite the day. Uh, so that's definitely what's got me eating my vegetables. Um, that hope. Uh, anyway, all right, so stimming. So I actually like the definition of, of stimming from uh, the snowball site a bit more than the one that appears in the book. Mm -hmm. So perhaps just because it sounds more technical, I don't know why. But so we have stimming maps different forms of the same word to a common quote stim. Mm -hmm. So their example is, for example, the English stimmer maps connection, connections, connective, connected, and connecting all to connect. And there you can okay. see <clears throat> that basically what's going on is uh, suffix removal. Um, and it all happens on the, the right side of the word, the end of the word. And just to throw back to something we said earlier, I think in the first chapter in Leila's uh, presentation, this is basically dealing with morphology. So the components of words are how words are formed. And just, <clears throat> and also to put it in context of uh, pipelines or, or uh, text analysis workflows, this is uh, feature engineering, this is pre-processing, mm -hmm. and one of the things that uh, the benefits that people talk about in, in stimming is um, reducing the dimensionality of your data. So if you think about a document term matrix, mm -hmm. right, terms, you have, you have P terms mm -hmm. or you have N terms, whichever variable you want to use for that, and um, you're reducing the size of the magnitude of either P or N by, by for example, here, <clears throat> we can just use this example of connect, right? Just by performing, so assuming that all of these words, connection, connections, connective, connected, connecting, assuming and connect, <clears throat> assuming all of those appear in your data set, you're going to reduce, by using stimming, you're going to reduce your, the dimensionality of your data set by one, two, three, four, five, by five words, because the six words will go down to one. So that's the, um, that's the, the big yeah. idea, go ahead. I have a question. So um, uh, Justin, uh, thank you for that. So um, you, you are saying, okay, this is part of maybe uh, uh, as, um, some kind of processing step um, just to reduce the dimensionality of our data. But what can you say about, uh, for example, um, neural networks that they have, they understand maybe the semantics, you know, the context, they understand the context. So if we stem, so, you know, the, the, the context meaning and stuff may change. Do we really do stemming in neural networks or stuff like that? I don't know. I just, I, I haven't used neural networks with, uh, mm -hmm. with text before. So, so, so the answer is, I don't know, but we'll find out, I guess, if we, if we keep reading this book, mm -hmm. perhaps, hopefully. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I do know that neural networks, I mean, part of the appeal is that they learn features. So yeah. they do, you know, feature engineering yeah. sort of by themselves. But, uh, yeah. but anyway, so I can't answer that question. Yeah, so similar to the last chapter, um, stop word, so in, um, uh, in classical machine learning, of course, we remove stop one and stop just to reduce the dimensionality, as you may mentioned. So also, I think the same also is similar to that, but in deep learning, like linear network, um, we don't just remove the stop word, we just give the, all the text to maybe um, the network and it learn the features and, and understand the context and stuff like that. Um, you, know, you don't need to remove the, uh, uh, the stop word. So, so I think also this one, I'm not sure maybe, um, you need not to remove uh, to stem. You just give it to the learning algorithms. Um, it performs the future engineering stuff and understand the context and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, all right. Let's see. I'm just gonna. I'll move on. Just to, so by way of uh, introduct, like introducing um, <clears throat> the data. So I, I decided to not work with the uh, the fir tree. Uh, just because, I don't know, uh, I, I have a personal project where I just want to analyze some 
podcast transcripts. So I decided why not use uh, one of those here. Mm -hmm. So um, I so here I have so okay so I just loaded loaded some libraries general purpose libraries that I'll be using. Um, and then after that, I have here the data for this presentation comes from a lightly processed transcript of an interview with a philosopher named David Chalmers uh, on the 80,000 Hours podcast, which is a podcast that I, I recommend to all the people and bots watching this presentation now. Um, <clears throat> and anyway, but uh, I, I did very little. I literally did this yesterday uh, morning. So uh, I, I didn't process it very much, but basically, uh, every line in this data set, which I've called Chalmers, because that's the surname of the of the uh, interviewee, uh, is just people talking, and it's very conversational. You'll see that there's a lot, there are a lot of uh, you know contractions in there, a lot of uh, uh, speech pragmatics, um, but it's also you'll see that it has some like very academic stuff too. So it's uh, perhaps an interesting data set. And uh, anyway, they have, I think, like 200 interviews here. So it's actually, I mean, considering their podcast transcripts as a data set, uh, it might be interesting. Uh, Is it a line per or episode per row? Uh, no, it's, um, well, let me see if I can. I thought it really matters, but. Yeah, no, uh, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a good idea to, you know, know what the data set is. Oh no, this opened. All right, unfortunately this opened with uh, numbers. Um, oh, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, but no, no, I just wanna see if I can, new share, there we go. Uh, this is what the raw data set looks like. So each line I've called an utterance. So it's not necessarily, it, it's these these lines were divided by the people, they're basically, um, so I scraped this from their website. So it's anytime the P tag in HTML closed. It's like anytime a P opened and closed, so P is, is what these utterances are. So that's uh, how we got this. It's a paragraph. Right, yeah. So, but the kind of utterance, I mean, but you can see, <clears throat> so yeah, so, so that is a paragraph tag, but I mean, you see, <laughs> Here in the beginning of the interview, they're talking about uh, Australian football, right? So anyway, and they're pretty, they're, you know, and they can be very short, not even sentence replies, but then, you know, you scroll down a little bit here and they're talking about AI research, right? So, uh, so it's a pretty heterogeneous, uh, I guess, utterance length and uh, stuff, all right. But so I don't want to get too into the weeds there. All right, so hopefully you can see <clears throat> the uh, knitted document again. Um, sorry, so again, so, so this is just, you know, so, well, I guess now both of you have seen the raw data. Um, and then if we just look at, so it, uh, this is uh, chapter two of the book, I believe. And this is chapter three of the book, giving the stop words. <clears throat> so that's the pre-processing we've seen before. So I just, I did that. Mechanically, uh, and then here's here are what the top twenty words look like, having removed the stop words. Mm -hmm. So you can see, uh, really, there are some things that should be stop words here, but they're contractions, um, so they didn't get taken out. But you can see we have think, consciousness, people, conscious, and that that'll actually be an, that'll be th something we see later: consciousness and conscious. All right, <clears throat> or well. We'll see how those words get stemmed. All right, so moving on to uh, pass the data. So it seems like in, in R, or at least uh, in this book, sort of the default is the snowball stimmer that was originally developed by Martin Porter and, and published in 1980. Uh, and I found this interesting. And actually he got that name snowball from uh, a previous um, string manipulation program that uh, was written this way, Snowball, which is kind of a, a more cute way of, of writing it, but it was an acronym. Uh, and <clears throat> kind of to, to preview some things that it's gonna it's gonna do, um, it's going to have it's gonna map words 
so it's going to map English words to words that aren't necessarily English words. So for example, as far as I know, uh, you cannot use S-T-O-R-I in Scrabble, for example. Um, but it is what, the, if, you if you pass story to it with a Y, if you pass the plural stories to it, it's going to give you uh, this stem. And now to use the Snowball algorithm in R, you'll actually use an R interface to Snowball C that uh, was created by this, uh, this French guy. So, so that's nice of him. And to actually use it in R, uh, you just download the package and, uh, and then load it. And then you can, for example, um, inside, you know, so this is the tokenized uh, data set. You can just add a column that is the stem of the word. So if we do something similar to before to see the most common stems in the package, or sorry, in the data set, um, we get these. Uh, note, here's one interesting thing. Um, this is something that they talk about later in the book, what happens to uh, contractions. Um, we see, you know, think and like. So, well, one thing to point out is, so notice that there are 697 instances of think, whereas before uh, there were 613. So, right, so there's been an addition of, uh, of quite a few instances. So, so different words have gotten mapped on to think. Uh, conscious is now at 428. Uh, and before we had, so we had this consciousness and conscious. Oh, interesting. Actually, I hadn't noticed that it should be, oh no, no, it should have been, it's interesting that it's that low. Hmm, I'll have to look at that later. Um, but one of the things that I, they didn't do in the book, but I actually thought is a useful exercise to see <clears throat> is you can, uh, use a, a dplyr function distinct to get all the distinct, to get all the unique uh, word stem pairs, and then count them by stem. And what that will do is show you uh, how many words uh, that appear, how many tokens that appear, get mapped onto a certain stem. So, um, so we see here, for example, that simul has nine words mapped onto it. C O N T I N U, it's six words mapped onto it, etc. Um, and if you want to, if one wants to see what these actually are, um, this unfortunately didn't print out the whole thing. Um, but so the C O N T I N U, which you see had six words mapped onto it, you see these are the six words they get mapped onto it in this data set. Um, and I think this is probably a good thing to do if you actually, you know, instead of just this demonstration, if you're substantively interested in stuff, you might see some problems given specific applications, like, oh, you know, these two words should not be mapped onto the same stem. Um, and so, for example, here's simulation real quick, or, or simul, you know, so all these words get mapped onto this. And I think this is, so, I mean, this is, again, showing the power of it. So this, you know, would reduce the representation of this data set by, by eight. Right, and here I think uh, it's very successful. I mean, these are all words that are semantically related, and um, it would be kind of a waste to to not to not have them be related at all in the uh, just in the representation of this as like a bag of words. So anyway, so so that is nice. Uh, this I'm not really going to cover. They, they just kind of mentioned in a throwaway comment that you can tokenize word stems. So basically do uh, the, the tokenization stemming in the same uh, step in a workflow. Uh, it, they don't mention how they would use it. This just seems like what uh, you would use it or how you would use it. And it seems kind of difficult to do this because you wouldn't, you lose some ability to do, to have a uh, stop words. Um, so, so I'm not sure about this, but it exists within the book. Uh, creators of the tokenizers package did this. So I, mean, I assume it has some, some utility. Um, this, like, this is another thing where I'm not sure what its utility is, but I think knowing, that, knowing about its existence maybe uh, 
is interesting to just show kind of an underlying assumption of the, the Porter stimmer, the snowball stimmer. So, um, so basically we have, this was like a, so it's a, the Porter stimmer is, you can think of as a function, right? It starts with a word and it maps it onto a single stem, right? So that's, that's what a, a function does. Um, but <clears throat> there's this, this Hun spell, which is uh, a stimmer that they call a dictionary-based stimmer. And it maps words onto multiple possible stems. Um, and so here's just an example of how that would look. Uh, so again, we take the tokenized data set, we use this Hunspell stem function from the Hunspell package. And, and yet you get this, you get uh, a new column that is a list. So with just some uh, manipulation of that, you can see what actually happened. And so for example, <clears throat> the word investment is not mapped onto invest, for example, which I, I assume is what would happen at the Porter stimmer. It actually gets mapped onto four different possible stems. So investment, investment, vestment, vest, and invest. Um, so I'm not really sure what to make of that. I'm not sure exactly what utility it has, um, but some notes. And, and, you, and I, I arranged this such that, so this is the only one that has uh, four, it, that gets mapped onto four stems. A lot, a lot of words get mapped onto two stems. Um, but I mean, some of these are just wild. Like Peter gets mapped onto pet. <laughs> I'm not really sure about that. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's pretty wild. Uh, so, so if you have any questions about that, I probably will be able to answer them. Uh, this section, I don't go into anything in depth, but is probably very useful. So um, everything I've said now, I think is, is fairly positive about stimming, but well, no, I'll reserve the, the but for later. So, so one positive is that it reduces the feature space, but I talked about that. But just remember, people talk about the curse of high dimensionality. So, uh, I mean, your data set's going to be high dimensional anyway, if it's text. But, uh, you know, you want to reduce dimensionality. Um, I think one thing that, to me, um, is going to be rough to deal with later is that stimming just makes so much sense. Um, like, so, you know, I, I, well, no, you probably don't know. I study in the social sciences, you know, I might study like uh, politician speaking. And so let's say there are three different candidates and I have the text for their uh, announcement speeches, their campaign announcement speeches. Candidate one, somewhere in his or her speech says educational attainment. Uh, candidate two mentions Department of Education and uh, somewhere in candidate three's uh, campaign announcement speech, he or she says the word educate. Now, without stimming <clears throat> and assuming that this was the only use of education uh, or educational or educate, right? If I didn't use stimming, uh, I would say that, you know, I, I would just lose that commonality, but obviously they're addressing the same thing. Um, so here, you know, I write, so there's a sense in which, a very intuitive sense in which they've addressed the same issue, but what I call normal tokenizing is not going to, um, is not going to pick that up. So what stimming does at its best is it maps those three tokens, which a computer is not going to know have any relation to each other onto like the same, I hear I kind of squiggle because it's kind of, kind of idea. It is, uh, so, so there you're thinking of it more semantically as opposed to um, just this morphological process. But anyway, um, and one, one thing that uh, is mentioned in the book is, so <clears throat> is going back now to reducing dimensionality. It, they, they, they say, here's the trade-off though, um, that we're assuming we haven't lost any important information by stimming. So um, it depends on what you're interested in. Perhaps you think that using like a verb is very different from using a noun, you know, that information is going to be lost. Um, or so using a certain, so educate versus educate versus education. Uh, but I mean, parts of speech aren't, don't figure into a bag of words analyses, but implicitly you could say they do uh, because verbs are kept, you know, are not stemmed down to, uh, are not reduced to their sort of non part of speech 
stems. But in any case, um, so that's one yeah. comment they make. Yeah. Uh, we, were you going to say something there, Sean? Yeah. So um, um, I'm thinking it in the way that um, the whole idea of um, like um, uh, removing like stop words or trying to trim down all these common words to a single term was previously. So one of the idea why the stop word was, was removed in some text analysis was just to improve the speed of the learning algorithms. But now um, we have the machine that are capable of doing those stuff. Um, I mean, we have powerful machine that we don't need to uh, remove the stop word that they can do that in so fast. So I'm not sure even like um, with stop word, um, and, uh, but for stop word, that's one of the uh, main idea to increase the performance. I don't know for the scheming, um, looking at the language, uh, as, I always, as I said previously, um, the classical machine learning algorithm, they don't understand the contextual meaning, like support vector machine, like all those classical, they don't have the, con so it makes sense for those kind of algorithm if we remove stop word, and I don't know for the, um, also the doing scheming, but um, for deep learning stuff, um, they understand the concept. So what can you say like um, uh, regarding to this? Uh, I mean, I assume that, so, um, I, I mean, they, they would definitely reduce the time it takes to fit a model. Yeah. So I'm sorry, using stimming would mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I'm not, I haven't thought about it yet, but uh, I mean, the arguments for using, for removing stop words and for performing stimming would be at least slightly different. And mm -hmm. that people assume stop words are just not yeah. diagnostic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the differential frequencies of using and yeah. are just not for in a topic model, for example, are just mm -hmm. not gonna. It's just mm -hmm. information that you don't want. It's like straight, it's noise. So uh whereas stimming, it's not that particular endings are noise. Uh again, I, I think it's partially a dimensionality reduction thing and partially it just makes a lot of intuitive sense um yeah to do it to again i think it, it corresponds to an intuition about semantics mm -hmm. i think so mm -hmm. so which which i don't think that argument applies for uh stop words mm -hmm. really so anyway that's my that's yeah. my feeling yeah, but definitely. but just to um to get to this. So this is actually a, a paper that the um, the authors of the book mentioned and I, I really recommend. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a paper about uh, topic modeling. Well, it's about stimming and its effects as a pre-processing step in topic modeling. And basically what these authors do is they apply to, I think, four different corpora uh, quite a few different stimming algorithms mm -hmm. and then fit um, topic models on those different data sets and then examine <clears throat> uh, the performance of these LDA models using three different criteria that are pretty pretty different. I mean, held out likelihood is just a statistical measure. Uh, and then these two topic coherence and clustering consistency are more substantive. And they, in general, find that um, topic modeling is not aided by stimming, which just, um, it's very counterintuitive to me because stimming does seem like something that both from a um, sort of variability reduction in reducing dimension space, dimensionality and, uh, and, some, and just the intuitive argument for stimming makes a lot of sense. So anyway, so <clears throat> I've only started reading this paper uh, this morning, actually. Uh, but it, like I said, it's very good, very well written. It seems to be very thorough. And uh, later I'll do a, a Google Scholar search to see what the reaction was to it among published papers. But anyway, I, I can definitely recommend that paper. Okay. Um, what about the learning? Um, 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 not the topic modeling. Um, have they tried to uh, see about the performance? Um, of learning algorithm after staining or without staining and stuff like that? Um, 
I, I, that's not talked about in this paper. I do remember one time I did it. I just on like as a class assignment, uh, we had to uh, do classification. And I do remember one time that stimming did not help, did not help my classification at all. And uh, so that was the first run-in I had with, with stimming being to me theoretically very appealing, uh, but sometimes practically disappointing. <laughs> so yeah, all right, let's see. Oh, we're halfway through the time. So I'm gonna tr maybe try to move a bit quickly, a bit more quickly, but I welcome any comments. So uh, this one, I, I will go through this pretty quickly. Um, they have a section 4.3 called understanding, understand, I forget if they actually, maybe I uh, stemmed <laughs> this one <Stimmy>. without, <laughs> I, I think I may have stemmed, uh, stemmed that. Um, so, <clears throat> but it, it's actually uh, very interesting to me. Uh, so this is how the Porter algorithm understands words. So it's in, so here you could all, you can call these groups of consonants or a, a, usually I think in linguistics they'd be called a cluster, a consonant cluster. And so it understands words as being uh, having an optional consonant cluster at the beginning, <clears throat> uh, an optional vowel at the end or a group of vowels, uh, and then composed of in the middle uh, these vowel consonant groups that are grouped together. And the number of occurrences of these things. Is, is M, is the measure of the word. So <clears throat> this is actually a pretty bad use of bullet points because these are, I'm trying to illustrate two different things. Uh, tree, uh, if, you, if you think about this, it actually has a measure of zero. So it doesn't have this part at all. Uh, and it has C, which is this TR group. So that's the con initial consonant cluster followed by V. Um, so, so, so notice that that's how you have to parse tree according to this algorithm, because there's no vowel consonant group at any point in the word. So it has a measure of zero. So that's the theoretical minimum and well, not only theoretical, but the actual minimum is having a measure of zero. So that is, does happen. Here's a word that I just think people don't use enough. Phloxenoset uh, nihilipification it is an actual word. Is it in, English? Um, in English, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 derived from I think five Latin parts, um, like directly from Latin parts. Like it was uh, like a Latin like a schoolboy joke for mm -hmm. uh, in Latin class. Okay. Anyway, it it, it means like uh, considering something as worthless. Okay. Right. So perhaps if you don't like today's uh, presentation, you in your head would have performed flocks and nos and the hillification on stimming, right? You would have. <laughs> <laughs> you would have considered it as, uh, as worthless. <laughs> um, and so I'm actually in, in the effort, or not in the effort, but in the in pursuance of, of being on time, I'm, I'm not going to really cover this. I'm just going to say that, um, I'm going to come back up to this in a second. But so there are five steps to the Porter algorithm uh, that in the book are presented somewhat kind of cryptically, like you would not be able to implement the Porter algorithm from what they say in the book. But uh, the, the Snowball site, Maybe I can just, oops, hopefully I'll be able to go, go back. Uh, actually has uh, a really good, a lot of good resources uh, and, and including um, kind of like a, a log of changes and improvements. Uh, and if you like to nerd out on linguistic stuff, uh, I really recommend the site. Um, okay, good, I was able to go back. Um, and so that's where you, and you can see the in-depth um, presentation of the, um, so of the algorithm both in English language and I think you can uh, see its implementation in C, which okay. doesn't do me a lot of good because I don't, uh, so, I don't I work in C. So Justin, um, the algorithm yeah. um, this is only for English, right? If one wants to adapt it to other languages, it must be different, right? Exactly, so, so yeah, so that, that's a really good point. And we can see, I mean, just, just notice that this is extremely language. Like, I mean, it, it, I was gonna say extremely language bound, like literally it's taking specific English plural, pluralization strategies wow. and mapping them. So like, you know, SSES, word terminal SSES gets mapped onto SS, IES gets mapped onto I. Okay. And uh, something that I got, I deleted something that gets mapped onto S, probably ES, I think, it, no, no, it wouldn't be that. Anyway, 
Um, <clears throat> anyway, it, it, so yeah, I said, I said I wasn't going to go into this, so I'm not going to. But just to show you how uh, it would, um, by way of example, how it would process Floxinos in the hill epification. So what it does first is it, I think in step two, uh, which so this is this kind of cryptic regularized 20 word endings, uh, it sees Asian and maps it onto eight. Uh, so, so it maps, in this case, the noun onto the verb, um, although it's not seeing it that way, right? Because it doesn't process parts of speech, but that's in effect what it's doing. And then in step three, it takes this verb suffix, ikate, I-C-A-T-E, and it maps it onto I-C. And then I believe in step four, which is just this removal of 19 word endings, it takes that IC and I indicate it with null empty set, but uh, it just maps it onto nothing. It deletes it basically. So that, that, and then we can see if I use snowball C word stem on the word, indeed that's what you, uh, what you get. And, and that's not a word by the way. So <clears throat> and as, as far as I know, this is also not a word. This is a word, however obscure, this is also a word. Uh, starting in step three, it's no longer, no longer a word. Um, so that's how, I mean, no, that, that's an example of uh, the processing of one word by the Porter algorithm. Um, so uh, I was gonna say if there are any questions about that, now's the time to ask, but I'm not even sure if now's the time to ask because I'm not sure that I'd be able to answer it. Um, I'm going to skip this. Uh, th so this is an important thing to consider. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there are a lot of contractions in the data set that I was working with. Um, and, and they point out in theirs that, you know, trees does not get mapped on to uh, tree, which, but like trees does when it's the plural of trees. Uh, so here's trees. I assume this could be either a contraction or it could be a possessive. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, so punctuation does cause an issue. And so here they mention um, using a different, so, so they have their own regular expression for splitting words on either so the or, uh, white space or punctuation. And, and, it, and they like the result there. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna say anything about it because uh, I don't have any insights. Um, this is just a comparison of, of the, the stimming options that are out there, of some. So you can think of an extremely simple stimmer that just removes final S's indiscriminately. Um, and that's all it does. Uh, there's a three rules. So this actually exists. There's a, something called the S stimmer that has three rules, which um, you can stare at here. Um, but basically, it, it also, it's just a more advanced version of removing final S's, um, depending on what comes before the final S. And then there's the full border algorithm. And here, what they do is they, they, um, they just compare the, the most prevalent tokens uh, using these <clears throat> three different algorithms. And you can see, so for example, consciousness which you know has two S's, uh, you know, the um, remove final S algorithm, that's, that's all it does. So it just removed the final S. Whereas for both the Hartman, well, so say Hart, Hartman is more sophisticated and recognizes that the double S is not plural. So for example, it doesn't blop it off. Um, and then here we can see Porter stimming uh, is more advanced and recognizes the whole suffix of, you know, it, Miss and lops that off. So these are three levels of, of sophistication. And one thing that um, I failed to mention in whether or not you should do uh, stimming, I think it's section 4.2, is one of the main things you want to avoid is what's called over conflation. And I don't think we've seen any examples of that, but it's when words that should not be mapped together get mapped onto the same word. So people call what happens in, um, well, because a, a stimming algorithm essentially is a func is it what, what you call many to one function, where it takes a lot of things and maps them onto the same thing. That's referred to as conflation because it's combining all these things. It's conflating them together. 
And whenever that happens too much, that's called overconflation. And so um, I think even the Porter stimming algorithm is considered in the space of all stimming algorithms to be relatively conservative. But that's um, something I should, I realized I, I should have mentioned earlier. Uh, all right, I'm gonna move on. Um, and then these are words that are done differently. So just focusing on uh, the rows in the data set that are, are different between the three different stimmings. Um, I'm not sure how, uh, so let's, just, let's just pick one, let's pick technologies. Here's one where it's different for every single, uh, every single word, or sorry, every single algorithm. So here, lopping off the S, that's of course what's gonna happen. Um, we see that the, the Hartman S, is it Hartman or Harman? I think it's Harman, yeah. All right, uh, the Harman um, actually restores technologies to technology. So again, um, here's a very bizarre one in the, the Harman uh, S algorithm mm -hmm. and, um, and then technologies. All right, so I think one of the things that is, um, uh, to, go ahead. Just none of this schema is, schema is perfect, right? Or at least a conservative one. Is, is what, what do you say? None of I, them are what? None of the schemas that is perfect. No. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so so one, one thing that uh, I wanted to mention that I find very interesting. So mm -hmm. I, I, I mentioned earlier that stimming corresponds to what I what I call like a semantic intuition that the words that you know have these different uh, suffixes are really referring to the same idea. And that seems like a useful thing to have in mind when you're doing topic modeling, that words with different suffixes can be referring to or can be produced by the same topic. Um, and so in the book they talk about as an alternative to stimming, limitization. And so it's helpful to know what lemma is. Uh, and you, as, as usual, Wikipedia does a, a great job of this. So I'm actually just gonna point out a few things from this. So a lemma, so it's a term from morphology, uh, is what you would call, you can has different aliases, a canonical form, a dictionary form, or a citation form of a set of words. So they actually, I think unwittingly, give a really good example of why limitization can be better than stimming. So for example, in English, different tenses of the verb break, so break in the infinitive, breaks, broke, broken, and breaking, you would say all have the same lexeme, or sorry, all forms of the same lexeme. Um, and, and here it's kind of complicated. That, so, so you have a terminology lexeme and lemma. So again, so just to reiterate, lemma is this uh, dictionary form, citation form. So like, for example, say that you, um, you know, want to look up uh, broken. Uh, you know, you can't really look up a broken in a dictionary. In fact, if you do look up broken in a dictionary, I think if I'm not mistaken, what would happen is they would say, go see break, basically. So <clears throat> because break is the lemma. And so one thing that's really nice about this is think about what a stimming algorithm, like how it would break in this case, right? So it's because here, because part of English and, and German, at least, and I assume other Germanic languages is in some cases, <clears throat> to change internal elements of a word. Uh, in making the past tense, I know in German, you can change the internal parts of the word, making them plural. Um, so that, that might not be addressed by a, a rule-based stimmer that just looks at basically suffixes. Um, so anyway, so, I, so, so limitization is like a more semantically informed version of stimming. Um, and in fact, here they, in the book, they refer to it as linguistics based. Um, <clears throat> and so, so you might wonder why not use it more. Uh, and it's really, I imagine because of this. 
that it's a lot slower. Um, so I mean, in fact, orders of magnitude slower, as they say. Um, but nevertheless, you can do it. Um, so there's Spacey, uh, which has its R implementation. Um, and, uh, but also you can use it in text recipes and clean NLP, which I'm not familiar with clean NLP at all. Um, <clears throat> so actually, I realized that I didn't have Spacey R installed on my, so I didn't have Spacey installed on my computer. So I actually wasn't able to run this. Um, but this is the pipeline that they, they demonstrate. And if you look in the book, uh, when they do it, um, there are a lot of different things that come out. Like for example, uh, punctuation is preserved in when you do limitization. And what's interesting perhaps is that punctuation is preserved in the sense that like a comma, a period, a semicolon are just preserved as such. Whereas for example, pronouns are all limitized, limitized, limitized to prawn right, to their part of speech. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and, uh, and they just recommend uh, not doing entity recognition if you don't need it because it's very slow. Entity recognition being like uh, sort of like part of speech, but also proper noun labeling. Um, Anyway, so they don't go into it much more, which is curious. It would be uh, interesting to see the relative performance of limitization versus stimming. Exactly. And, uh, and perhaps that'll happen later in the book, or if not, um, I'll do it on some pet project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm, after being disappointed by stimming, I'm not too optimistic about limitization. Yeah. So lemmatization is somehow more intelligent than stemming, right? Well, stemming is just yeah. words to, you know, to their base. But lemmatization, as you made mention, is linguistic base. It just lemmatized the word to it is lemma, uh, which makes more sense. It would not change the meaning of the contextual meaning in some ways. Um, it, yeah. So I think lemmatization uh, for me will be more useful, I think, um, uh, than stemming. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely intuitively, theoretically mm -hmm. superior, for sure. But sometimes, you know, the, the world disagrees mm -hmm. with what I think is superior. Yeah. And uh, like, who knows, uh, stemming might turn out to be better or both turn out to be equally bad. Mm. Right. Or, or, or not particularly effective. Okay. So, so, so I don't know. Uh, again, they don't, they don't talk, they don't have like a performance, like any type of benchmarking here. Mm -hmm. That would be, that would be useful. Um, but it is, well, no, I was going to say, it's interesting that uh, at least this, imp the spacey implementation keeps punctuation, which, you know, you could think that's useful. Um, but, uh, but that's not like the heart of limitization. So I don't want to muddy the waters of, of limitization by talking about punctuation. Um, let's see, they have, for some reason, I decided to write this in German. Sehr wichtig. It's uh, order of operations is very important. Uh, it just seems like so important that it's good to write a, like a, in a harsh language, right? Um, this is just why I, I, all they're showing in this this uh, section is that uh, basically you need to do stimming after removing stop words because you will stem words down to forms. You will stem what you would consider stop words down to forms that do not appear in a stop word dictionary. And then thus, if you stem before you remove stop words, will sort of pass through. That's really, I mean, this is, you know, they, they write some custom functions and blah, 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 but that's really what it is. It's just order of operations is important, I think is the takeaway for this section, so. You know, I'll upload this. It's in the book, but uh, it's not that, not that important. I mean, it's important, but it's not mind blowing. And that's actually it. So, uh, so the summary uh, is kind of sad. Looking down here, uh, what what was stimming? It's removing, denuding. I think people don't use that word enough. Uh, base stem of its affixes, which is a a fancy word for both suffixes and 
the, the parts that come before. So anyway, a suffix is a particular kind of affix that appears after the stem or the base. Uh, benefits decreases sparsity and decreases the feature space, dimensionality, every data. So those are the, the pros. It has some, you know, not always successful in its performance. Uh, there were different algorithms. And then we looked at the comparison of, we started, we could, in theory, looked at a comparison of limitization with stemming as two alternatives to achieve roughly the same goal. And that's it. That's what was, uh, that was today's, that was today's presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, now we will have um, the next week. I guess the next week will be um, Warren Bill or something like that. Yeah, the next chapter. Uh, yeah, I think. I think, you know, uh, word embeddings, if I'm not mistaken, are going to provide uh, an interesting alternative to, to some of this, right? Because uh, word embeddings take semantics into account. So exactly. they will be able to recognize similarities mm -hmm. between, you know, the like, for example, break, broken, broke, yeah. breaking, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I think I have to sign up uh, for the embedding. Um, we still have yes. more yeah. chapter. Oh, okay. From embedding, we finish the pre-processing stuff steps. Then we start going moving into the machine learning. So we have the first chapter, chapter six, which is preparation, and the next sub classification. So anybody can sign up. I know Justin has been giving a lecture for ISL, uh, uh, statistical learning. And <laughs> uh, yeah, so Juan also um Chapter six and seven are free. If anyone's uh, is free, um, yeah, up. absolutely. Hey, just a quick question on monetization. Um, I don't know if the book covered this in detail, but it's rule based, right? Just like any other like stemming algorithms, like like the example you mentioned, break. So I'm wondering how broken goes to break. So I think that it's not rule based. It's dictionary based. Mm -hmm. Dictionary based. Okay. So that's yeah. why it's so slow, right? Or is the magnitude slow? Right, that's my impression. Is that it requires a lot of like lookups. I'm not sure how it's implemented, but that's how I would. That's how I explained it to myself. Just a lot of like looking up, looking up words. Hmm. Yeah, it's something we should like. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so and, and I know that that, for example, <clears throat> part of speech will will come into play there too. So so I don't know how. So in the book, they they turn off entity recognition, uh, and I just don't. I, I guess I don't know how the spacey algorithm works, but it seems. Um, so so I'm trying to think. Of, I, I'm not going to think of an example off the top of my head. But we would be here for too long. Um, but I mean, words can change meaning. Like it can just be a completely different word if it appears as a if the same the same literal letters appear as a noun versus a, a verb, and limitization should pick that up, and so it seems like and again this is my ignorance of, of the implementation, but it seems like it would need the the limitizer would need um, part of speech information, so that would also make it make it uh, quite a bit slower. Like for example, uh, just to, oh, I did come up with an example. So for example, if I say I'm broke, right? That has nothing to do, that broke as an adjective has nothing to do with he broke the blender, right? So, so limitization right. would map, he broke the, the broke if he broke the blender onto break and it would not map I'm broke onto break. So, so that's when entity, uh, what was the exact wording entity recognition that comes into play? Um, and I'm guessing that's rule-based, like linguistics rule-based, not a lookup of like the orders of the sentences. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. I, I just know that that's one of like the main things that Spacey does is, is the part of speech recognition. Uh, but again, that's something that uh, I should have come into this 
just I should just do it for like life. I shouldn't have to worry <laughs> about that. But but yeah, so I'm not sure how it does it. It's magic. I'm just gonna say it's magic until I, I figure it out. It's it's a black box. Yep. <laughs> for me. Yeah. yeah. So um I, I'm just look, looking up something about the Demakaiser. Um so this guy's like looking at the GitHub. Um basically implement the Demakaiser for um Irish, I think, uh, I share the GitHub report. So this, we use the dictionary and the rule base for the lemmatizer and also seek to seek model neural network to uh, develop the lemmatizer and the seek to seek neural network model performs data for like uh, with 99.2 accuracy and 80% accuracy with the rule base. So yeah, you can. <laughs> There's wow, a French probably... abstract, but not the content. <laughs> yeah? There's a French abstract, but not the body of the text. Ah, uh, no, no, that's a GitHub report. Uh, did I share that? You you sent us a, a PDF. Oh, what about the GitHub? The, the, uh, look at the, the second. I, I, oh, there's a second, okay. The second one. I see, I see. Wow, that's very... How, how did you just find an... Early Irish limitizer. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty unique right there. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally know nothing about the. Uh, I okay, I, I know probably like three things maximum about the Irish language. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, so it's just. I, I mean, this session maybe may inspire me to uh, do a limitizer for my own language <laughs> because that is mom. So. Maybe I can try to see how I can. Uh, you should make one, Sham. Eh? Yeah. You should make a limitizer <laughs> in uh, Nigerian languages. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it would be good. Like, um, yeah, I, I would look at it. Yeah. Justin, do you study linguistics? Is that what, you, is that what you're in school for? No, I study uh, political science. But I, when I, I did my undergrad in psychology and I did my honors thesis with a psycholinguist. So that's, huh. I think we're, kind of, I, I just like, I like languages, so. Yeah, also he does text analysis a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, no and uh, we see you all, I think, if we are on top of the hour, we see next week. Have a good weekend, guys. Okay, have a weekend. Good weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.